What's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to The Standard. Today we have head coach of the College of Idaho football team, Mike Morosky. I was able to start working with him in 2019. Uh, he's turned into one of my biggest mentors and love what he does with his athletes and his kids and the entire community, and that's why I wanted him to come on. Appreciate it, Coach. Thanks for coming on. So Coach Peterson came in? Well, he came, He no, via Zoom to talk to the team. And uh, he had a bunch of neat things like, like what's your recipe when you fail? You know, what do you, what do, you do? So it was really, really practical stuff. And one of his things was the power of cliché. And I really question him on that because I am not a cliché guy. Yeah. In fact, I try hard to not be cliché. My thought is it wears thin on guys. It, uh, you know, it, it um, they get tired of it or they hear it. So I was just back at Clemson visiting my son who, who works in the sports med at, at, uh, with, the, with the football team. And they got all these things. You don't have a lot of them out there, I noticed. I'm, I'm on the same as okay. you. The more so, you see so, it, the less you think about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. So, so anyway, so I just found that as interesting. But I think it also ties to I'm interested in being my own guy, you know. So even though... My college coach was very influential. Some of the pro coaches I had were influential. All of them would say, and any book you read would say, you still got to be true to who you are versus trying to create a persona yep. or trying to be like some, too much like somebody. So, yeah. uh, what was his, what was his, you know, uh, rationale behind the power of cliche? He just said they can be, uh, remembered and, um, they can make an impact. So it's it more, uh, but I interpret it as it, it's a way to change your thought pattern. So, which I, I did like that, yeah. com, that part, you know, like so uh, especially in terms of success, failure, motivation, you know, that, yeah. kind, that kind of stuff. You know, I just ta I ta did talk to the guys yesterday about um, Rayburg, you know, because it's, it's always driven me crazy yeah. that... Uh, why are you working out so hard now? Yeah, and I know, but why weren't? Where were you three years ago? You yeah. know, in terms of really getting serious about working out. Yeah, and Garrett's going to have a chance if he runs that five three forty. You know, he's going to get into a camp. I think. I yeah. mean, a big guy, and and uh, um, but we were talking about the the whole alcohol thing too. No alcohol. So, what is it about performance? Um, what is my goal in performance for the for the team? Coach Jewell uh, mentioned too. He was listening to Kalen DeBoer, yeah. Alabama's new coach, yeah. and they were asking about the first day of practice, and that's just the way it is at those places. You know, they're asking about everything. You know, are you going to win the national title after one day of practice? But the guy he was talking about was their quarterback, Jalen Milrow. Yep. Have you read anything yeah. about him? No, I mean, not he, not a ton. No. He said, different guy. There at four thirty in the morning, oh, beats yeah. the coaches to the facility, and I just asked the guys, what, "What do you think this guy's motivation is? Do you think it's NIL? I don't think so. Do you think it's getting a higher draft spot? Some people don't even have him on their boards yep. projected as a quarterback. It's just something about this guy, you know. Especially, so I really perked up to that. I thought, you know, and that it." turns Kalen DeBoer's head. I think it also turned uh, Saban's head too. But those are the interesting things that I know you're interested in is what, you know, uh, what about performance, you know, and peak performance. And my question to you would be, is there really a peak or is there always more ground to cover to do it smarter, better, all those things? So, Yeah, it's tricky for me. You know, when the guys come into, into pro day, to be fair for Garrett, he worked hard for us. You know, no when, doubt. He, when he when he no was, doubt. I mean, from where he came from, but definitely it's an, on another level now. And and this has been every guy that I've ever been affiliated with. Oh, 100%. Who's, who's going from college to pro. Oh, 100%. Yeah. It doesn't matter what, what program, too. You know, besides maybe Alabama's quarterback, but most guys, it's like, okay, now it's like I'm trying to change my now life. Now all of a sudden you yeah. have to try. What, yeah. But what could have been if you would have done it then? You know what I mean? And, and I think guys do it, you know, as they mature. And, and something that I'm trying to like, I feel like one of my skill sets is being able to relate with the athletes. And so one of the things I'm trying to get with them is like relate with them in understanding where they are at, at right now, mm -hmm. but knowing where they're going to want to be. And mm -hmm. if I can close that gap to where it doesn't take 
as many failures or as many struggles or as many of those mess ups or getting in troubles or feeling like shit every single day. You know what I mean? If I can close that gap to where maybe a sophomore figures it out instead mm-hmm. of it's a fifth year senior, or it's like I'm going I'm, now it's, I'm a senior and now I'm starting to figure it out if I would have been doing it earlier or not even if it's just football, but it's like, okay, now I'm taking care of my life uh, outside of the field, outside of the weight room, outside of the classroom. And now I'm better in there 24. It's like, man, if you could have done that when you were 16, 20, 21, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And that's, mm-hmm. that's kind of like been my message lately has been more of like trying to be with them where they're at. Like I was there, I get it. I want to have fun. Mm-hmm. I want to be there mm-hmm. too. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? But like the, um, the amount of work that you can, can, can put out increases as you, as you, as to me, as you gain experience, as the more work that you do. Like, it's like, if I could have, for how much work I can do now, being married, having kids, having all these employees, running these many, pro, this many programs, but now I'm just 10 times more efficient. It's like my standard of work mm-hmm. has changed a ton. Mm-hmm. If I could have figured that out at a younger age, I thought I worked really, really hard, but it wasn't, it, right. it wasn't as hard as right. I could have worked. You yeah. know what I mean? And to me, I know you have to have experience to get there, but it's like if I can, I'm trying to yeah, figure no, out how I can bring that. that's great. I like that. I like that. One of my go-tos is, uh, and guys don't like to hear this, it, college guys, this is the least busy time of your life. Why not 100%. take advantage of it? And 100%. I think you can have a great time. I think you can have the time of your life, but you can also do, let's just say, a lot more than you think you can. Way more. You know, and it's so, so but, but that's all, like you said, that's learning and process and all that sort of thing. Yeah. But it's mindset too, like we were talking about, 100%. you know, so it's, uh, you know, what about, cause I would say, cause I was just a guy as a kid, high school, played football, basketball, baseball, and just loved to play. Did not love school. Had to go to school cause my dad was a principal and my mom was a school teacher and, you know, I had four siblings and they were all really bright and I was average bright and, uh. But I love to play. Yeah, I love to play, and uh, so. Um, but I didn't know. At, I didn't have any idea at that time what it meant to really excel. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even lift weights in college. Yeah, barely, because I played sports all the time. And did my, did and anyone? That was one of my. There was a few, was gonna, there, very few, very few. But there was a couple guys. There was one other guy drafted. Uh, in the fifth round, the same year that I was drafted in the sixth round, and he could run probably big D ends, 250 pounds, which was big for Back those then. those days, and uh, ran a fast four six or so, maybe Jeez. four five, Jeez. and was a lifter. You know, learned learned and was a beast, and uh, got drafted in the fifth round and played seven or eight years in the pros. Something I battle with all the time. What What is different from your side of things in performance, like in strength and conditioning, like in my world, compared to like what you did back then? And I know in college, you played a ton of sports, but how about even when you were in the NFL or when you first started coaching? What What do you think is some of the biggest things that you've seen change? Uh, I think there's a more scientific approach. Uh, I think there's also the perception back then was – for the lifters, they were a different breed. You know, they were, um, well, hate to be derogatory, but I'd call them fire hydrants, you know. So, so when, and I thought, especially when I got into coaching, <coughs> I don't want a bunch of fire hydrants. I need a couple, but I, yeah. you know, I, need, I need all sorts, you yeah. know. So, and that's what you, you've brought for sure is uh, it's every guy, every body type, every uh, particular skill group. Um, you know, it's kind of just for the, linebackers and linemen, you know, kind of kind of back in the day. And then very few, and even at my time at Davis. So I started at Davis and uh, finished playing in 1986, started coaching seriously in 1989 probably at, at Davis. And even at that time, the, the quarterbacks would kind of have something to do. Some were <laughs> into it from high school. And then gradually – more and more, we'd run into guys from yep. good high school programs and good lifting programs, and clearly it was for for everybody. But at Davis, we didn't, for sure, didn't have a weight room when I was in uh, college, and then they built one, but it was more of, of a rec rec center. Y- yeah, yeah, with machines and stuff like that. But still, you could do any weight room; you can do what you need to do. Yeah, it's just not as efficient for for groups. But uh, then we. Um, Built a little weight room out by the football field, and it began to transform a little bit. But um, uh, I think the science side, so back to your question, the science side, 
um, the personal side, the different body type skill sets. And, um, and then again, what you brought, which mm-hmm. has really helped our, our program at College of Idaho is uh, just a dynamic approach mm-hmm. that it's flexibility, explosion, strength, all the, all those things tied into one. You could even roll nutrition and stuff like that and high performance. So yeah. that's what makes it a um, tip of the iceberg sort of right. realm is yeah. there's, we barely scratch the surface, you know, and, and there's so much you can do and, and uh, great stuff you can do. So it's, it's, uh, I think it's, I think it's more exciting too. I think it's more healthy. I think uh, it appeals to a wider group of people. And so I think it's really, really good. I, you know, I at a in a good place for me in my position. Probably shouldn't say, it, but I struggle with you. I mean, they talk about pro athletes back in the day smoking cigarettes and having beers before and still playing and performing and doing all these things and not lifting a ton and, and injury rates and different things like that. Now you can argue the types of bodies and the athletes that we have now. I mean, the, the velocities and miles per hour and the the amount of impact that we have now is different, but. I talk with my coaches all the time because we break down what, what we're doing. It's like, are, is what we're doing actually helping? You know what I mean? And I, I, I do believe that, but sometimes mm-hmm. it's like we get a kid hurt or we get in a program and we're like, we're not, and we're struggling. And it's like, I think back to the days where how, I mean, maybe this goes to the mentality things and maybe it's like too much science on the guys, but that the toughness and the, the mentality, it's like some of that I don't know if we're missing these days or it's like every little thing is bugging a kid now or, so now we're moving so fast that the body's just not ready for that yet, or moving, or you're pushing so much weight, or, or hitting something, somebody so hard. But it's like, man, was this shit going on back in the day too? And these guys weren't even trying near as hard as us. My warm ups more than what you guys used to do for a workout, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And I battle that all the time, you know. what I mean, and I, I'm 100 percent anything that I'll ever put in front of an athlete or a kid. I mean, I believe in 100 percent before I'd ever let a kid do that. Mm-hmm. But then when I see stuff and it's like, man, are they moving optimally? Or if a ha- guy, I think we got the hammy right, everything's good, and then he does it again, and then or you know, or something. One of our best players, you know, just working really hard, cuts funny, foot goes in a weird spot. It's like, man, was this stuff happening back then? And nobody was taking care of their body the way that they are now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's a, uh, it's been tough for me on that mentality side. Yeah. And, no, and, it's, and the, it's an interesting thing, and I'll, I'll just say this about that is that. Since the beginning of time, guys have taken care of, both taken care of their bodies, and there's a group of guys that have not taken care as, right. as well as they should. Um, the guys that can make it, you know, regardless of what they do, my opinion, are freaks. Yeah. And there's been freaks forever, yeah. uh, just like there is today. And, um, but what's gotten different now is that, that um, Good strength and conditioning is more accessible to more people at a younger age, and so yep. so I think it's for sure um, really really good. But may, maybe the number one thing I'd say is just just becoming more in tune with your with your body, yeah. you know, and uh, and how the body and the mind and all those things are are interconnected too for confidence and and uh, all those kind of stuff. But who was uh, one of the freaks that you played with? You feel like in the NFL, if you don't mind me asking, um, or a couple of them. I mean, you got to throw a touchdown to Jerry Rice. Yeah, like there, was, there was a, there was, a, and really, they they were different. So I'm trying to think if there was anybody. One of my favorite guys, and I was telling um, B. Rich, one of you know about uh, Billy White Shoes Johnson okay. was in Atlanta, and Billy was um, most famous for being with the Houston Oilers, and he had this crazy touchdown dance. So so he went from the Houston Oilers to the Toronto Argonauts or what Canadian league team came back to Atlanta when I was there. First of all, one of the greatest people I've ever known. Second of all, um, I remember it was a strike year and we'd play basketball every day. And then we'd go out and run. He'd say, Mike, come along, let's run some hills, you know? And while I wasn't a lifter, even back in those days, uh, I liked fitness. I like to run. I like to, you know, yep. really push the envelope in that way. So he, but, but anyway, we were playing basketball and he's this little guy, 5'10", tremendous athlete, but he could D me up. I'm 6'4". And, you know, sometimes it's tough as a basketball guy with <laughs> yeah. a little guy in your grill kind of, but we'd have some battles, you know, so we just had fun and he'd laugh and we'd laugh and, and he made me look really good. But then I looked down at his knees in that era. So that would have been 19... 82 or 83, something like that. Two huge scars on, on both knees. And maybe maybe there was two on one knee. So ACL surgery, it was like, 
a crazy. banana split. I mean, it was just crazy. <laughs> I said, Billy, how, how are you doing with that? I mean, it looks terrible. He says, Mike, I'm stronger than ever. Stronger than ever. So he believed, you know what we were talking about a little bit earlier. He believed, if I rehab good enough, I believe in the human body and its power to heal yep. and uh, taking care of myself. And he did. And sure enough, I don't think he got hurt again the, the rest of the time I was with him. But he was just fun to be around, fun, you know, and just had this uh, energy, yeah. you know, but that I'm stronger now than I was before, yeah. which you know, guys, so right, with ACLs that, that are better off. off. Well, sometimes, yeah, it, it go both ways. It can go both ways. Yes, 100%. But, but some. And, and the mindset yes, is huge on it. Some, you know, mindset, physical, they're as good as new. Yeah. And so uh, anyway, so that was very, very intriguing. So, But freakish, Billy was freakish in the uh, mentality sense. When I got to the 49ers, Jerry Rice was in his second year. The guy guy, the the alpha in the group was Ronnie Lott, though, by far, in my opinion, of, of the guy. And I didn't play very long or with that many different guys. But my opinion, best football player I've ever seen in my life because of the influence he had on the team, not by talking or anything, just the way he worked. He was mean, but he was also one of the nicest guys. First guy to say hi. Hey, Mike Morosky, how you doing? I'm thinking... How the hell do you know who I am, you know? And, uh, but I played against him, and he was just on it. You know, he's just – anyway, but he was uh, – How was, did he influence he, him? Like, that's – influence is a huge thing that I, I, I try to look into. I what think we, it was example. I think it was um, um, just the standards of excellence. Bill Walsh talks about this, this a lot. And I don't know if I've ever given you that book. I, I got a copy in my office for you if you want one. It's called uh, – the score will take care of itself. But one of Bill Walsh's things was if you raise on your team, if you, so it's, t- it's talking about leadership, if you raise with your guys their own personal standards of excellence and they continue to rise and then somehow it begins to expand a little bit and, you know, and influence it and you got a group of guys with individually – increasing uh, standards of excellence. And then that begins to grow still more. He said, now you have something going on. So I think Ronnie had this. uh, So Ronnie Lott, USC, people remember him, all America, hard hitter and all that. First of all, super smart, super conscientious, all those things. Played corner his first two years in the NFL at six, two and a half 220. Big, yeah. Not a corner's body. Especially then. Not a great corner, but a great football player. I was in Atlanta. We played him twice because we were in their division. Every game plan against the 49ers was we're going after Lot at corner. And, you know, we won some, lost some, but it was like, this guy's pretty good. He's a good football player. Then they moved him to safety, and the rest is history, right. kind of. But the influence, that the other example that I have was – um he literally, uh, on that team, I forget where the kid was from, Tim McKire. Remember his name? Tim McKire. We could look him up, I suppose. Fifth-round draft pick of the 49ers. They drafted him to play the um, uh, slot corner uh, in third-down situations. And he was just a little bit sleepy, you know, just very talented, just not super into it. Uh, but was. I mean, he was he was a pro player, right. draft pick, excited and all that. But I still remember Ronnie going to him one day. And I, I just happened to be in proximity. It's not like it was a show or everybody on the team saw. But he's basically he's this close to him saying, we don't practice like that. <laughs> it's time to go. But pretty aggressive. Yeah, pretty aggressive. Pretty aggressive. Yeah, Ronnie also choked out a ball boy one day because he stole, <laughs> stole his shoe. So a very intense guy. And um, that situation, that was in training camp at, at Sierra Junior College in Rockland, California. And even his boys were saying, Ronnie, Ronnie, let him, what are you doing? Let, let him up. And he finally lets the kid up and he's gasping for air, runs off crying. Junior high kid. <laughs> uh, one of the coach's sons, you know. Um, and uh, Ronnie looked at those guys and said, well, somebody's got to teach him. 
I don't steal my shoes. <laughs> That's you crazy. Know? So anyway, but he was just uh, he was just such a pro, so great. And uh, and then later saw him uh, at the 49er facility. I was done. He had been traded to the Jets or went to the Jets. Talked to him just briefly. He probably wouldn't even recognize uh, know me, but uh, he just said, "It's not the same. It's a modern era. You know, people. The modern athlete." F- forgets is what he said but my interpretation of that was they don't always appreciate all of the the little detail and things in um mindset so again ronnie lott freak physically freak hitter freak football player but freak mindset too and then jerry rice of course um my stories about him were so it was his second year when I was there in 1986. His first year, number one draft pick, Mississippi Valley College. Who the heck is this guy? Did Bill Walsh draft? I mean, they were like, uh, I don't think they had a great year the previous year. Draft him. Jerry has a terrible year. Lots of drops. Second year um, was, was my year, or my one year there, and uh, he was a different guy, but very, very driven. So any quarterback would know, can't find enough guys to be able to throw. You know, I just, I like to throw. I'd like, I could throw damn near all day. I just, I just loved it. I love still to throw. throwing yeah. darts. The boys very, pregame. And very happy that I can still throw and I don't have any arm issues. And, and it's just fun. It's therapeutic. You know, for yeah. my dad, it was shooting baskets. My dad shot basketball hoops, you know, uh, till he was 90 years old, you oh, know, and he awesome. said, Mike, you got to do this. You got to do something every day. So this is kind of my, my deal. But, um, um, so loving to throw. So I was at the facility, 49ers had a terrible facility at the time. Um, but it's fine. And then, uh, but Jerry said, Hey Mike, you want to throw? And he'd get a guy corner to, to cover him. And that's crazy. He'd run routes as long as I could throw routes. That's crazy. And I don't even know how much weightlifting he did. I do know that he's the first guy that I ever saw that was very interested in his body fat composition and stuff like that. So the musculature, because I think he probably weighed 210 coming out of college and finished playing at like 193, 20 years late. I mean, yeah. I played for 20 years you know, so, and never got hurt. Yeah. So that's the, that's the freakish part, too. I'm not sure I ever saw Ronnie Lott get hurt. Except for you only had nine fingers, right, or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Billy White Shoes got hurt, but you'd ne- you would never know it. So so anyway, so there was something. And those are my three uh, the freak three mindset. favorite guys. I love that. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Those would be huge examples for me. Yeah. Let's go to the Yotes. So when, and this is something that I've been wanting to talk to you about, cause business side of things. You pretty much – I know College of Idaho had a football team before you came, but then we had a – gap where we there was no football program and you you started it it was like starting a business and trying to do that and coming in from uc davis coming into caldwell coming into idaho and i know and maybe you can go into it on how the relationship with peterson when he was at boise state but what was your goal when you came in on like how did you start setting your culture your standard your how did how did what was you know year one year two what did you know hey i'm gonna do these things and I know it obviously wasn't easy, but what was your goal when you started this program? And how, right. how'd you go about it? Yeah, and, I, and, I, and I, I guess you're right. I did have goals. I did have a, a plan, but it was pretty loose because I'd never been a head coach before. I like to think that I'm pretty observant. Uh, my background was UC Davis, so I played at UC Davis. And then uh, after my playing career, uh, coached at UC Davis for almost 25 years. And, and had uh, my former head coach and Coach Peterson's head coach was there for a short time when I got back, but he remained a mentor of mine. And then uh, his underling, a guy by the name of Bob Biggs, uh, was the guy that I worked for. Both tremendous people and viewed the world a little bit, little bit differently. But the couple things that you see Davis that were stuck with me were, um, one, build with freshmen. Okay. And culturally, you know, maybe I'm able to articulate a little bit now, better now is it gives you a time to build the culture versus JC guys and or a lot of JC guys. We always had it. We always had a couple transfers. But uh, so that was one thing. 
UC Davis was a very academic school, like College of Idaho is. And even if I wasn't at a, quote, academic school, I think I'd still uh, recruit um, academically motivated guys. Yeah. Show something about about them and, and about discipline. their upbringing and discipline, yeah. all, all those things. So, uh, so that's, that's one thing. But I think the other thing was um, treat people well. Treat them well. Take an interest in them. I was meeting with one of the presidents today, and, you know, we had a minor disagreement. But anyway, that, that's not important. But as I was thinking about what I wanted to tell him, I said, you know, I just want you to know that I feel like I'm the students, the players, advocate. And I want you to know that I take that very, very seriously. In other words, I'm a fierce advocate for these guys. I'm asking them to commit to College of Idaho and to me and, and the program. It's bigger than me, obviously. But, uh, but in return, I'm committing to you and I'm going to be fiercely loyal and fiercely uh, advocate for you, whatever happens, whether yeah. that's if you get in trouble, whether that's if you need a job, whether that's if you need um, a recommendation, whatever it is. But because nothing delights me more than seeing guys be successful later on. So, yeah. And I'm sure you can relate to that, too. you got guys that are doing great, you know, and even finished careers by now. Right. And, yeah. and are very, very thankful. But. I think that does a couple of things. It, it, it allows you to tap into a different level of the human psyche, and it's more than just, what can you do for me on the field? Um, and not that any good coach does just that, but sometimes it can feel like that yep. to the players. So I'm always looking for ways where, how will these guys know that I care about them? Yeah. So I take a big interest in the medical side of things, which which you also do a great job of, and the 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 uh, connection between the medical and the and the uh, performance and training yes. and and all those things. So so that's what I love about having having you out there. Um, but that's critical. That yes. matters. You'll see when your kids grow up if one of them gets hurt, is a coach interested? Yeah. You know, and I had a guy who I loved early in my career had an ACL, and um, I think I called him maybe, uh, but maybe didn't go see him. And in those days, it was back the Billy White Shoes days where you were laid in a hospital bed for four days, you know, okay. after, after an ACL surgery. And he told me, and he was a very successful guy. He was a chief of staff or, a, you know, the speaker of the house in California, just super successful guy at UC Davis. And he said, you know, Coach, I'll never forget that no one came to see me. And Oof. I thought, shit, you know, you are right. That was terrible, you know. And uh, so it's just, so the medical part, um, again, for any parent, but for any kid, kids will remember the day they got injured, you know. <laughs> They'll remember, you know. So much. And so, so that has to matter. So the fact that my son is a, is a surgeon, you know, I've learned a lot of talking points. Interestingly, he said, because he did a surgical fellowship at um, the Andrews Clinic in Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah, best in the country. He said, Nick Saban, on top of everything medically, their trainer, I can send you an article about their, about their trainer. I think I've mentioned to you before, but tremendous guy. Jeff Allen is the trainer's name. And, and uh, he said, Saban is so on it, so on everything, you know, wants to know, okay, what graft did you get in the ACL? What, you know, how many uh, anchors did you have in, the, in your labrum repair in your shoulder and, and uh, all, all sorts of stuff. And uh, obviously wanting to know when he can play, but what's going to be best, all that sort of thing. Whereas now my son's at Clemson and uh, Dabo Sweeney, one of the great coaches in America, great human being, great, great, all these things and is involved, but not quite to the detail. Yeah. And the longer I've been a head coach, you know, I tell my son, I said, I think you ought to have a meet, sit down with Coach Sweeney because he needs to know how important it is. Because kids these days, at that level especially, are thinking, well, do I really want to get my sports hernia fixed by you? Or should I go to the University of Pittsburgh? Or um, do you even fix sports hernias? 
Some people do, some people don't. Um, but all the surgery, in the, in the complicated um, world, it's tough. ACLs are relatively straightforward, basically. Uh, but um, it's just interesting. But anyway, that back to the medical, back to my interest in the, in the medical, it's just a way of being involved yeah. and, and assuring the families that I recruit, that I want to be part of the ongoing, you know, yoke program yep. during and after they graduate. It's just showing that you care. And I've been far from perfect on that. I'm sure that people will say, man, that guy was not perfect, but I still work at it and know that, know that it's important. So, but same thing with coaches. We're talking in context here of how do you treat people? And, uh, and maybe w- where I've changed maybe in the last five years is um, in assuring uh, young people that I believe in them. And so that's been a revelation. What do you mean? Um, good question. I'll back up a little bit to earlier in my career, and even the way I was with myself, my own my own motivation was pretty hard on myself. Um, prided myself in being analytical, but if you're around analytical people, sometimes it quickly um, drifts into pessimism yeah. and cr- a critical nature or critical spirit, and. Um, you know, e- even within the last five years, but I could, and I could be like that as a coach. I love the guys. I love being an assistant. I love, love the group of guys. And, and I could be sarcastic and can, could hold them off. But, but I finally realized, but uh, am I, am I instilling anything positive in these, in these guys? And, um, I remember, I mean, we can all remember our, our playing careers and, and just, yeah, I'm confident, but I could be more confident, you know. Yeah. I mean, do I, I do I, do I really believe? Yeah, on yeah. the edge, yeah, yeah. Or, or in the clutch, you yeah. know. And and uh, still face that. That's why I love being around sports. That there's these pressure packed right. situations that are fantastic. And and but um, does my quarterback? Does my uh, offensive lineman? Does my uh, corner uh, think that Coach Morosky believes that? You know, and and now to get to that point, you know, it takes a lot of work. And yeah. but it's just helped me, though, Taylor, be more positive, you know, and realize that. Uh, knowing that somebody believes in you is, is huge. Yeah. But it's ultimately for the purpose that you believe in yourself. And so backtrack a little bit. Uh, San Francisco 49ers, 1986. I've been in the league seven years. Um, and Joe Montana gets hurt. The backup gets hurt. Yours truly starting against the Green Bay Packers in Milwaukee. Unfortunately, not Lambeau, Lambeau Field. Green Bay used to play one game at Milwaukee County Stadium every year. And this is the first time I've, uh, I can't sleep. Ever. Any sort of game, I mean, I sleep like a baby before the game. Still sleep pretty good, even before well, big I, games. I have to pick your brain on that because <laughs> I don't. Um, and uh, interestingly, the World Series was on, and it was the World Series game where the ball rolled through Bill Buckner's legs. And I'm thinking, wait, I'm a Bill Buckner fan when he was with the Dodgers. I was, you know, I was a guy. He I was coached me. His guys. Did he really? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so – that got me going a little bit, you know, and you could, we were in the, this Marriott hotel in, in Milwaukee and uh, ball rolls through Buckner's legs and you could hear the groans from every room in the hotel. <laughs> oh, <coughs> and, um, but anyway, couldn't sleep and thought, um, man, what am I doing? It's three o'clock in the morning, the biggest game, you know, ever, biggest opportunity I'm, uh, you know, this is the 49ers. These, this is the wor- world champion 49ers. The Walsh. And here I, you know, here, what the hell am I doing here? You know, how did this happen? And it's great, fun, exciting, but now, they're, you know, it's the reality of, you know, we're kicking off in a little bit. And uh, um, 
But I just thought to myself, it's, well, the thought came to me. It's not like I had this big, big revelation or anything, but finally said, why not? Why not me? You know, and that was like at 4 a.m., so I got a couple hours of sleep. But similar, the next How'd the most, game go? We won. Uh, Let's go. It, it's funny. So, so we won. <laughs> it's, it's funny because that's the game I threw a touchdown pass to Jerry Rice. But, uh, and was it? Oh, I do got a couple records. That would have to be another, another conversation. I heard about but, your record. But for, was... for analytics uh, yeah. fiends out there. But uh, we won the game. We were behind. Uh, first quarter, we had four plays. I got sacked. Green Bay's up. 14 zip. We came back and won, but we won because Ronnie Lott had two pick sixes in the fourth quarter. So <laughs> nice job, quarterback. <laughs> uh, but that similar feeling came up my very first game with the Yotes. We go over to Pacific and, um, and I can't sleep and, uh, or don't sleep good. And um, I get up and go for a run. Beautiful day. Oh, we're staying in Beaverton, I think. And, and, uh, you know, I'm just wondering, how's it going to go? And I knew we had some good players. We just didn't have a lot of good players like we, like we do today. That's the way our program's changed. We've always had good players. We just have more of them now, so it's, so it's more competitive. And I'm thinking, man, how are we going to do? And just whatever. It was just my first time as a head coach. And, but, and this is in that self-belief context. Yeah. And uh, the thought came to me, very similar to... In that Milwaukee uh, hotel was, you are made for this moment. You know, it was just a cool thing. I love so, it. All right, let's go. Let's you know, go. So, That's anyway. awesome. So, uh, but similarly with players, you know, I want them to know, yeah, they're made for this moment. This is what we prepared for. You know, yeah. whether it's a big game, whether it's a big practice, whether it's uh, the mundane, you know, whether these are the moments that are going to lead us to, you know, great things either character-wise, business, whatever it is. I, I, I do think all of life kind of fits together. And lastly, I'll just say, I do believe in football. I do believe that <laughs> it. it makes, it can make people better. Yeah. And compet the right competitiveness and doing the dirty work, all that kind of stuff. Going back to your analytical part where you said sometimes almost – over analytical where you are pessimistic compared to optimistic like how you said that change to me in business same thing for me it's like it's so easy to crunch the numbers okay this isn't going to work or we can't do this because of this or because I know business has done this before and then somebody told me one time you know pessimists they're they're always right but optimists always win you mm -hmm. know and it, and it's and I still it's a business and I got lives to look after and my employees and stuff like that but sometimes it's like even if the numbers don't work right, and my 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 mentors and my business consultants and they're like, I don't think we go do this. But if it's like I know, I know that we should go do this. I know that this is where we're gonna go to. You know what I mean? And even and it's something that's exciting for me or my whole staff or my athletes or my coaches. You know what I mean? Usually that's the stuff that keeps me up at night, stresses me out. Is it gonna work or anything like that? But being optimistic about that and wanting to go get that, I think, is uh, when we've made big jumps compared to times where it's like the numbers say I don't do this. Or mm -hmm. even in programming where it's like, I shouldn't let this kid go do this, but the kid looks like he can. You know what I mean? And it's just, I think you can take that into any facet in life, marriage, relationships. It's easy to just point out all the things that are going wrong and compared to the times, you mm -hmm. know, where just uh, being optimistic, it's, it's, I'm very critical of myself and I see me doing that to my staff or my kids or my wife or different things. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's not helping anybody. And right. so right. that's a, that's something that I'm yeah, always trying to work on too. Yeah, because you mentioned family life and uh I mean college college working with college guys I love partly because there's so much going on yeah you know and and so much is going to happen in in that four or five year period 18 to 23 years old um but the overly analytical part so even if things are tough what good does it do for you to be right irritated overly critical, you know, as you said, those things don't do anybody any good. And it takes a, it takes more effort and more skill, I think, to overcome that kind of and say, man, I cannot, you know, let this affect even this meeting. I yep. mean, I, I tend to, and this is kind of maybe a little bit back to the cliche thing. I don't, 
I don't believe in sound bites. I think that every single meeting I have with the players is absolutely critical. And I think that that's absolutely essential for them to know that I'm not going to waste their time. Um, so I think, is this going to be a life changing meeting? You know, and uh, we had a couple very, very hot issues to discuss yesterday and spring break. We talked about Garrett, you know, I have to talk about things like um, alcohol and, you know, you have to have some restraint there, whether, whether it's the party culture or, or whatever it is, which happens in culture. And I don't think we have a issue at C of I, but uh, still I'm interested in, in high performance. I'm also interested in them running enough during spring break so they're ready to go Same. for the first day of practice. Um, I've been saying it for three months, getting, trying to get them ready for spring yeah, break. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Back to uh, believing in them. Oh, I know what I was going to say is, you know, uh, so we have our yoked steel, our, our mottos, you know, love the team, love the college, live with integrity. You know, everybody's those, that's as cliche as I get, but I try to rework that every time. So I save for the end of the meeting after we'd gone through these issues, I said, <laughs> Here's my new take on uh, Yield Steel. Be nice, be kind, and don't take any shit. And some of that is self, don't take any shit from myself, meaning like don't it. take it easy on myself, you know, don't feel sorry for yourself. No, let's get up. You have a responsibility to be on top of your game and go and all these things and face fess up when you make a mistake which I did yesterday, um, and that's life, right? And that's also taking care of your kids, taking care of your wife, yep. you know, uh, listening to your wife, you yeah. know I mean? It's, yeah. uh, it's not easy, but that's, I don't want to excuse myself for being a terrible listener, you know? I mean, yeah. that's, a, that's a, but uh, because we can all be better, and that's back to self-belief, all, all those things. Mm -hmm. So if I'm hitting on those cylinders, that makes me able to believe in young guys. I love it. What what does you, you use the word integrity a lot? And I've I got a couple of stories on it. But what does what does that mean to you? And like and like to me, I was trying to think of like how how you've built a culture. Small school, not a ton of money. Uh, recruits, different, different. I mean, the 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 dynamic we have with the other sports teams, with the presidents and different things. It's football. You know what I mean? Always a bullseye on our back mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And it it blows my mind how well you handle it how you de-escalate the situations that we have with our team, with the college, when we were going through COVID, how calm you were compared to other people that I was seeing running things. You know what I mean? What does what does in, integrity mean to you? Or do you even think about it? Like where where does that come from? Did you have a mentor that, you know, was it was it your dad like you talked about? Was it a coach that one of your – was it Bill Walsh? Was it a guy that influenced you that way? You know what I mean? And, and how do you uh, – like for an example, Garrett – I don't even know if you know this story very much, but I use this as an example for my kids trying to come to play for us. But uh, Garrett was getting recruited, had, I think, his last year paid for to go to a couple 1AA schools, Montana State, U of I, something like that. And he came in to your office to talk about going to visit for that last year. And you, everything was supporting. How can you help him get there? Obviously, you know, wanting him to stay, but you were going to do everything you could to make his, if, if that was something he was going to do, you were going to make it easy for him, even though that would have hurt us on mm -hmm. the football side of things, you know, as far as the X's and O's go. And literally he left the meeting and just texted me and said, I'm not going to leave Morosky just because of the way that you handled that and how mm -hmm. you did show that you cared for him. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Where, where does that come from? And how that to me, like I've always wanted to ask you what your philosophy is. That's whether that is intentional or not. That's, that's why I think that you've built the program that you've built. I think that's why I love being there. I think that's why the kids mm -hmm. love me. And I think mm -hmm. that's why we've, had so much success these, you know, these last few years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, undoubtedly family and the, the way I'm wired. I do think that's a, a strength maybe that I have is being able to communicate in a sincere way. And, and, um, and integrity just means true to yourself, I think. So it's as simple as that. Like so that. I'm into simple, simple definitions, though. I remember Coach Peterson saying one time, and this is what we deal with as a staff is uh, he said uh, integrity always trumps loyalty. 
So mm. it might be helpful for you and your business, but it, but I find it very challenging, you know. So just don't think you're being loyal to me. I need true to yourself and your profession, and we want to be better, you know. If I'm doing things right as a leader, you're going to help me, you know, be be better. I don't want to be in football unless I'm still learning and enjoying and and all that. Um, but my college coach, Jim Soker, was such an interesting guy in terms of leadership. I'll just throw this out. And again, maybe we can talk about this more another time. Yeah. But he really got into um, some leadership philosophy that I found very, very challenging. And it was kind of things like leading from behind, meaning, the, well, the way that manifests for me is um, I choose not to call the place. I could call the place, uh, but I choose not to call the place because I need an offensive coordinator to be dialed in and calling the place, you know. And if he's um, hitting on all cylinders, if Ryan Taylor's hitting on all cylinders and Braden Bale is doing his job and Coach Jewell is calling the defense and, and we're all working, we, we have a much better chance to be more effective, more impactful, more powerful even. So I find that very challenging, and I don't know how that works itself out all the time. So uh, but, um, but one is don't take yourself too seriously. And uh, my old college coach, when I got together with him, he passed away, sadly, um, way too young, 70s, at 77, about eight years ago. So that was a really, he never got to come up and see the Yotes play, but uh, so that was a bummer. But he's the one that told me when I was considering taking this job, he said, Mike, maybe this would be the greatest thing you've ever done. And it is, it's by far the greatest thing I've ever done. But one of his, one of his things that he used to say was, uh, if I were to say, because he was my guy that I could have breakfast with and just vent with whatever frustrations. And I'd say, well, you can't do this, I can't do that, or I'm having trouble with this. He said, why are you having so much trouble? <laughs> what do you mean you can't do that? You know, but basically it, it's where that came from. You know, even, even with the Packers, I thought of later that night before the Packers game. Why not me? Why not? Why not? Why not? You know, so so that kind of questioning of yourself. So with Garrett Rayberg, it's like, I don't want Garrett to leave. Just like I didn't want Andy Peters to leave this year. But what am I going to do? You don't say you're a dirtbag if you leave? I yeah. mean, one, I don't believe that. Two, <clears throat> um, these decision-making processes are... If I really view myself as an educator, you know, which I do, that's the way I view the coaching profession, I'm in education in the true sense, not in the book sense, not in the academic sense. But uh, uh, it really is fun and challenging to get to know guys. And ultimately, I'm interested in Garrett Rayberg and what's best for him. Yeah. And I think I told him, I don't know if he gave you this part of the story, I said, if you stay at College of Idaho... It'll be the biggest story in College of Idaho football history. If you go to the University of Idaho, it'll be the biggest story in College of Idaho football history. The fact that a D1 school wants one of our guys, you know, and he went and he would have done well. He would have, yeah. And, uh, but that kind of yeah. encapsulated it for me. What am I worried about, you know? And um, we'll be okay. That, that's what my coach Soaker used to say. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. You know, so yeah. it's, uh, there are storms. There are all sorts of things. But it's, it's, it's going to be all right. So, but that gets back to the self-belief, the integrity, all those things. But really simple formula. I do not have a complicated definition. I just try to Hello. live true to myself. I think that's awesome. That's, I think it's so hard these days. The, the going back to why not me or or believe in yourself like the victim mentality and we have it so much to where it's even like oh it's this early or a kid's more tired than the other guy or it's like everybody has their own issues and some people just show them way more than others some people have never had a hard circumstance so it's like they've never had to overcome a trial or something like that so when you know it's 
they have a test and then an early morning workout and then a practice, that's a hard situation for them. When you mm-hmm. have somebody else who's lost a parent or a, right. or a sibling, it's like, the, like, and I talk about that with the groups to where you can see some guys where it's like, oh, we're struggling because life's so hard on them. And it's like, bring them in and like try to get them to realize like there's real things that are going on in life that are extremely mm-hmm. hard. But going back to it, these are going to be the easiest years of your life. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. The best years, if you, if, if you enjoy them right, you know what I mean? But it's going to be, it's only going to get harder and harder. And I think that's what sports teach us to teach you how to deal with failure, the pressure situations mm-hmm. you talked about. And that's why I love this. You know, we're doing, we're doing pro day on, on Tuesday. And it, I mean, I've got the sweats already thinking about it. Cause we got guys just, just trying to make sure we make it there. And it's just a huge day. You know what I mean? But I think you need those pressure, pressure situations, but the victim mentality, the, it's not my fault. It's the transfer. It, like, I was seeing it in high schools before the NIL stuff, you know what I mean, where, you know, kids just leave and bounce. And it's uh, that's probably one of the biggest things that I struggle with because they're really good kids, but they just have never dealt with any issues, so they don't know how to handle it. Somebody's always taking care of it for them. It might not even have been their parent. It could have been their coach. Mm-hmm. It could have been a teacher. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, you can't write this or draw. I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. So they've mm-hmm. never had to overcome it themselves, you know what I mean? And that's that's freaking tough. I think the believing yeah. in yourself. I and think that, being and tr- that's what's nice about college football back yes. compared to high school or 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 uh, something else where you kind of have to go through all that you stuff. Figure it and out. even the NIL, the transfer portal. It's I'm a little worried about that. You know, yeah. I'm in, I'm not at the end end of my career. I'm excited about the next next number of years, but uh, who knows where it's going to go? Right. And it and you miss out on those opportunities to build that self-belief, yeah. you know? So it's a... Battle coming off the bench. Right. Yeah. Right. I think that you said it was simple, but the, the you know, integrity, being true to yourself, anytime that I see a kid being in, you know, like a terrible teammate or a bad person or it's like rude to others or, or, or you know, saying I can't play because of this or this, and it's usually because they're insecure because they don't believe in themselves. It's mm-hmm. usually not because they don't oh, yeah. like that kid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It always is comes back to not being true to their self because one, they don't know where they're at. And two, it's like, they don't believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. Part of it is they've never been told that, that, that they can do it. Like you said, when they come in as a freshman, like, I believe in you. Like when you said that, it hit me hard. It's like, I've been thinking about this for a long time, how to help kids. I barely ever say that to my kids. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? To my, Mm -hmm. my, not my own kids, but the athletes that we coach with, you know, Ben Ruby, we just hired, we, he was just talking about a kid. He's like, Oh yeah, man, this guy, He's a good kid, works hard, but man, he talks a lot. He's always talking smack, and I and he didn't know that this da- kid's dad came in and said, "I don't." Why the kid was there? He goes, "I don't think he'll ever play varsity this school. He's he's not good enough to do that. He won't be big enough. So we're gonna maybe transfer schools. What do you think? Like, I don't think my son works at this. Like, it was like while wow, the son was there, and now you can see why the kid acts the way mm-hmm. he acts or does. And it's like, man. W- and we look at him, and he looks like a pretty good athlete. Like, he mm-hmm. could be all right. Like, maybe he doesn't start as a junior, but he's got a real shot mm-hmm. to work for us if mm-hmm. he keeps pushing it. But mm-hmm. how much better could he be if somebody believes in him? Mm-hmm. Your guy, white shoes. Billy White shoes. B- yeah. Billy White yeah. shoes yeah. just believed. On, uh, it was a belief. You know what I mean? That helps with yeah. tissue health. You know yeah. what I mean? To me, it's like if a yeah. kid, if that kid got told as a freshman how much he could do, who knows what could happen. You and know I what guess I, mean? I do, too. You said a couple things there that, that prompted me here that, the self-belief thing is is more of an organic thing. It's not just oh, I think I'm the best player yeah. in the world, you know. But it's but it's believing enough to put some feet to it, kind of. Yeah. You know. But but uh, and then in, in college, all those things that happen. I've had a couple conversations, and again, this is back to another Bill Walsh thing. Real quick is uh, every every guy on the team is important. Arguably, the bottom half of the roster is most important. They're the ones that are going to help you win championships. But, um, you know, I've told uh, more than, you know, guys struggling through life, class, you know, family issues, whatever. Um, Tell them, and this is a a great uh, privilege that I have as a coach to say, you know, I believe in you. And I don't think you believe in yourself. That's huge. As much as I believe in you. You know, in these ways, you can do it. You can be a better person. You don't have to be tossed to and fro by whatever the circumstances of of life are. You yeah. know, and and people come from. You know, I had a great mom and dad, and same great married. You know, yeah. and and so who who knows how um, 
a tougher family situation plays out in the psyche of a young guy. I don't know. And, uh, but I know it's not easy. You no. know, it's no, uh, and life's tough enough as it is. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I hope that resonates. You know, I don't, I don't know for sure. But, but again, I think, no, it, I think it is helpful that, no, I, I could have used that, I think, as a young guy, too, in cer- at certain stages. Um, and I do think of back in Pop Warner and uh, I think even uh, Coach Walsh one time said, hey, Mike, you're playing really good. In fact, he's the only coach in the NFL in eight years that called me on the phone and it was the second game I played after that Green Bay game, played against New Orleans, and we lost. And I threw for almost 300 yards, and we played well. He said, Mike, we just looked at the film, and you really played good. Just wanted to call and let you know that. Jeez. Hey, thanks. You know, landline era. Thanks, Coach. Then I get to work. That, so awesome, right? That's fantastic. Still highlights my life and, and influenced me right. as, a, as a coach, as a person, as a player. Next day, I find out Joe Montana's coming back, and I'm going, come on, Dale. You just knew Joe was coming <laughs> <Yeah>. back. <laughs> that's still, that's awesome. I, yeah. I think the self-belief comes from, and the, the, uh, with the kids, too, it, it comes from, like, building your own resume with yourself. Like, when you go through those tough things, but then you overcome it, then it's like, I mean, that's what builds that toughness. Then mm-hmm. it's the next one. Then mm-hmm. it's the next one. So mm-hmm. to me, it's it, 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 as easy as in the weight room. So, like, we deal with a lot of young kids, um, the first time they've ever felt a heavy weight on their back or, or trying to push or pick up, it's like it just crushes them. But then they realize, okay, I, I think I can do it. They felt it. You know what I mean? Or the first time you overcome right. a weight, that's then it, that builds confidence. You know what I mean? And that's what the weight room does. That's what any, any I think, issue does with our kids. And, and again, it's like some of them have never had an issue. And now they're 20 years old and their mom and dad's not there. And now they're having an issue and they don't know how to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And so I'm trying to get them like, hey, you can co- overcome this. You've never had to do this, but when you do it, it's going to make the next one better. Right. It's going to make the next one better. You know what I mean? And, and I think about any time that I've ever had like crazy, crazy issues with work. Like, I don't know if I've told you, but like I almost lost the business once with the partner. The whole thing went crazy. We almost lost this building. Um, with another long, crazy story. And I've said on a few different podcasts, but it's like immediately after those or within, you know, 30 to 90 days after those, like my business made the biggest jumps hmm. ever. You know, mm-hmm. um, I lost two of my best guys that have worked their just asses off for me forever, but they both got great careers and jobs and they just bounced at the same time. And then I ended up hiring a couple of the guys that are here and like the best staff that I've ever even had after, but it's like, it makes you sick. It makes you not sleep and stuff with my, my, my wife and us trying to have kids go through those issues. You know what I mean? And then how much stronger it makes you, you know what I mean? And these kids, I think it only, it, it just helps build that belief once they start learning how to overcome those. And mm-hmm. What I see is when, especially at, you know, a good academic school, some of the kids we have have been a little privileged. Some have been a little entitled and different things like that. And I don't think it's their fault. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not just there. It's any college kid that we have. And then that something hits them in the face and they don't know how to deal with it. But then mm-hmm. once they overcome it, then it just, whatever that guy's saying, that doesn't mean shit. You know, whatever mm-hmm. these guys are thinking, like it's like, mm-hmm. it, it is just all on me. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And when you see a kid realize that to me, that's the coolest thing in the world. You yeah. know, but I still, yeah. I don't, I think the word belief is such a simple word that I don't think I say. And the fact that you said that, it's just like, yeah, yeah. That's a and and easy, again, back to thing. that organic. See, so, so again, you said some great, that's great stuff, but it's, yeah, you want to have an adventuresome spirit. You yeah. want to embrace all challenges and bring it on, you know? Yeah. So it's, uh, but you're right. It's, it's those uh, little, little victories. Yep. So that's one of my personal mantras, you know? Love it. Learn to get by with little victories, you know, I love little it. by little. I know you got to get out soon, um, but uh, what's uh, I don't even know if you think about it. What's what's Coach Mo's legacy? What what what's next? I know we're still not coaching. a big legacy guy. Um, more of you how know, do you want to leave the program? They'll be well, certainly healthy. Certainly, um, I'm always concerned, you know, so, so I work hard at, uh, you know, building multiple layers of support, you know, financial. I mean, there could, there could come a day where I'm going to need to fund large parts of our scholarship pool with fundraised money. So it's, uh, it's being careful, being creative, um, 
But more importantly, we're on track, more substantially, I mean, in terms of the, the football part of things. I think it's, um, we just want to, I just want to make sure that uh, things are in order, that um, um, we're making strides. Obviously, the external things, facilities and stuff like that still has, has a long way to go. The substantial parts of the program really are the people. So I like that. So I, I worry about that just because of... Um, we don't have a lot of funding, you know, so it's keeping good people around. And and, uh, uh, and I hope that the person who comes in after me um, is way different than I am on one hand, um, but is um, but loves people and loves the game. You know, I mean, so uh, so and, and some of those things we talked about, that organic kind of integrity, too, which which I think I think the College of Idaho will be committed to hiring somebody like that. But that that's what you want, because I want it to be more successful when I'm done than while I'm here. And so that's my whole goal is to get us to a place where we're, we have a chance to be more successful. And if, you know, so I'm not looking for any last moment, hurrah, yeah. you know, I just want to do a good job. I want to be learning. I want to be, uh, uh, excited about what I'm doing, and, and and frankly, I am very, very revitalized. People like you are motivating to me, and and uh, the staff, you know, and the guys. I think it's as good a culture as we've ever had. Culture's people, it's you know. Culture's right people. So, uh, and yes, we built some of those, but we've gotten lucky with some of that. And guys have just shown up, and I think this incoming class you'll you'll really like too. And uh, so I think there's exciting times ahead. So, so may, maybe that's what, what I could say is my hope for the future is the exciting times are keep on coming. Well, we keep losing one or two games a year. It's going to be tough to be doing better. Mm-hmm. But uh, this culture is, is it's a crazy. This, the team that we have now, it's, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, there's times where I'm out running them and they're lifting on their own. But I'm, I'm right next to them, but I'm not watching them and then vice versa and coming through just because of numbers and staff and where we're at. And it's like, it almost makes me feel like I need to do more as a coach, but I don't even have to say anything. They're just absolutely mm-hmm. just pushing their self, pushing themselves to the limit, mm-hmm. and it's it's a uh, it's one of the coolest things. Ever. I literally brag every time I come back. I just like you should have saw what we did today. Mm-hmm. We had guys. Mm-hmm. Four, we don't do a ton of this conditioning, the old school. But we had four or five guys throw up last week on a Tuesday, mm-hmm. and then squat four hundred pounds mm-hmm. that same day after the run. You know what I mean? And just get after it and want it, and the energy was nuts, and it was just uh, it was. It's just crazy, and I don't even have, I don't even have to force them to do it anymore. It's the right. leadership, it's the seniors. It's but that shows what what you've been able to accomplish too, because when guys begin, it's back to that Bill Walsh thing. You raise the standards of excellence oh, where yes. they're doing it on yes. their own. You know, they're yep. doing what you want them to do on their own it's without crazy. you having to tell them. It's I mean, crazy. That's, that's what we all desire for our own kids. Yeah. That's what we all desire for. Football team, yep. you know, they have to because they can't be. You can't be as good in life. If you're just doing what you're supposed to do, there has to be some initiative to do above and beyond, basically. I love it. And that. love. Yeah. And love it. And that's where I think we are with the culture that, you, that you've helped create, too, is, yeah, we're working hard, but they love every minute of it. They do. It's so So cool. that's the way practice was last year, too. And, and so it's hard. I always go in. So this was the first meet essentially the first meeting for the 2024 season it was yesterday. And I said, it's a different team. This is a 2024 team. It's not the 2023 team. And what, what do we have to take from 2023? Well, we have to learn. We have to learn what we need to learn from 2023. But make no mistake, it's not going to be easier yeah. because we were successful in 2023. Yeah. We have to begin again. But there are things that we can learn. Because I just happened to watch the Kaiser film, the semifinal game. And those guys were freaking good. They were good. And we were right there. We were, yeah. And we had it. We, anyway, yeah. but so, so, so many things. But, but that's what you want in competition. Yeah. This far away from it, I'm not one to cry over spilled milk and, oh, I'll never forget that. Well, I'll never forget it in, in one sense. But we had our shot. We did. We just didn't do it. Yep. That's on me. That's on us you know we just gotta yep but sure was fun it was getting awesome. there so uh, and we will we'll get we'll get back there so because so, i because i love i love the guys crazy. and 
and it'll be fun. Even losing four offensive linemen, four starting offensive linemen. Pat Mahomes lost four starting offensive linemen, and he Came won the Super Bowl. So, and a receiver. Uh, and a receiver. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a uh, – we had – this is – I won't say their names, but we have kids come from the other NAI programs come here, and that you know, local guys that went somewhere else. I was giving smack about going there, but great kids. But they just hear about the stuff we're doing. And they hear they, – I don't know if it's social media or who they're talking to because they have boys, and it's like, oh, man, I wish we did – we're doing stuff like that. Or, or, oh, I heard you guys were doing this. And it's like – it's awesome. It's really cool just to see you, man. I can't – can't thank you enough for letting me be a part oh, of it yeah. four or five, five, six years ago now, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's been thank great. You. You've been awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Coach. Okay, thanks so much. Hell yeah.